Welcome back to lectures in endocrinology. This is lecture two. We have to continue from where we ended in lecture one. In lecture one, we had a general introduction to endocrinology, the different types of hormones that are being produced, and the general effect of hormones, how they operate. And we also looked at how hormones could be released from glandular cells, mechanism by which hormones could be released from glandular cells. We also looked at the mode of action for these hormones, though we didn't look into the details of each hormone that will be covered as we proceed with our lectures in endocrinology. So in this lecture now, we'll continue from there. So now, after you've measured the hormonal concentration in your samples, how are these hormones transported? So after the release of the hormones, the different types of hormones from the glandular cells, how are they transported from the point of production from the glandular cells to the target cells so how are they transported so this is where we are going to continue this is lecture two in endocrinology transport of hormones in the blood so how are these hormones transported so now they've been produced so how are they going to be transported so transport of hormones in the blood so the transportation of hormones in the blood, it's very important for you to understand the nature of hormones. So of which I told you to say that hormones are classified based on their structure or nature. We have the peptides or proteins. So those are peptide hormones or protein hormones. So in terms of nature, they are protein. So if they are protein, they are water soluble. So they don't need to bind to plasma proteins for them to be transported. They're just going to simply dissolve in plasma, then they'll be transported by the cardiovascular system. So they are proteins in nature. Then we have the amines. Amines, we have some which are fat soluble, others are water soluble. So the catecholamines are water soluble. They don't need to bind to anything. In most cases, they'll be just transported as free hormones that are dissolved in plasma. But we have the thyroid hormones that are fat soluble, so for them to be transported, they need to bind to plasma proteins. So the thyroxine, triiodothyronine, and tetraiodothyronine, for them to be transported, they need to bind to plasma proteins. Then, of course, the steroid hormones, because they are fat soluble, for them to be transported, most of them, they need to bind to plasma proteins to be transported. So water-soluble hormones, peptides, and catecholamines, these are water-soluble hormones. So for them to be transported, they are just going to dissolve in plasma, then they'll be transported from their sites of production to target tissues without binding to plasma proteins. So where they diffuse out of the capillaries, so once they are transported, they are going to diffuse out of the capillaries into the interstitial uh, spaces or fluid, then ultimately they are going to bind to target cells. So there are specific receptors they are going to bind to. So they are produced after production, they are released into the interstitium, then they will diffuse to the cardiovascular system. They will enter the cardiovascular system via the spaces, the pores that are associated with the capillaries. So they will enter the capillaries and then they will be transported by the cardiovascular system. Then they will be able to move to the target cells, bind to the receptors, then they will cause cellular response. So they will initiate a cascade of reactions. So once they go and bind to the receptors, maybe they will be changing the receptor shape and structure that will activate a cascade of reactions within the cell. Then you're going to get a cellular response. Then we also have steroids or thyroid hormones. These are fat soluble hormones. So those which are fat soluble, it simply means that they don't dissolve well in plasma or in water. So because they are not dissolving well in plasma or water, for them to be transported, they need to bind to plasma proteins so that they are rendered that solubility in water. So for them to be transported because they are fat soluble, they need to bind to plasma proteins. So most of the steroid hormones and thyroid hormones, they will be binding to plasma proteins for them to be transported. So they're going to circulate in blood mainly bound to plasma proteins, like I've already mentioned. So they will bind to plasma proteins. Hormone receptors. So I've been mentioning 
about receptors to which the hormones are going to bind. So what are different types of receptors to which these hormones can bind? The first step of hormones action is to bind to specific receptors at the target cell. So this is the first step. After the hormone has been released and then it has been transported to the target cells, the first step, you need the hormone to bind to the receptors of the target cells. So that's the first step, the interaction between the hormone and the specific receptors at the, at the target cell. So cells that lack receptors for hormones do not respond. So I told you to say the way the hormones would operate is similar to that of a TV station or a radio station, whereby a radio station is going to broadcast a signal. But for you to listen to that signal, you need to, to tune your radio to that particular channel so that you are able to receive the signal. So you'll be able to receive the reception because now you are tuning the radio to a particular channel to receive the signal. So it's the same even here. All those cells that are lacking the specific receptor for the hormone, you're not going to respond because the cell that is going to respond, it means that it has a specific receptor to which this hormone is going to bind and to bring about a cascade of reactions in this particular cell for it to respond. So receptor location, different locations of receptor that are interacting with the hormones. So there are different locations of receptors. So the first location is in or on the surface of the cell membrane. So associated within the cell membrane or on the surface of the cell membrane. So these are the receptors that are found on the plasma membrane of the cell membrane. Remember, we say that there are proteins associated with the plasma membrane of the cells. And some of those proteins, they'll function as receptors responding to the external signals and these external signals could be in form of neurotransmitters or hormones that we are discussing right now so some of the receptors are found within the plasma membrane of these cells so most of the receptors that are found in the plasma membrane of the cells they are going to be interacting with the hormones that are water soluble remember if the hormones are water soluble it means that they can't enter the phospholipid bilayer of the cells to enter the cells. So they are going to interact with the receptors that are just at the level of the plasma membrane. So the membrane receptors are specific mostly for protein, peptides, catecholamines, hormones. So all the proteins, all the peptides or catecholamine hormones, they are going to interact with the receptors that are found on the surface of the plasma membrane because they can't penetrate the cell, which makes sense. So you find that most of these receptors are found within the plasma membrane or on the surface of the plasma membrane that will be able to interact with certain types of hormones that are protein in nature, peptides, or catecholamines. We also have receptors that are found in the cytoplasm of the cells. So the cytoplasmic receptors are examples of intracellular receptors for particular hormones. So for these hormones to go and bind to cytoplasmic receptors, it means they have to be fat soluble for them to be able to penetrate the cells, to enter the cells and go and bind to receptors in the cytoplasm. So we do have receptors that are located in the cytoplasm. The primary receptors for different steroid hormones are found mainly in the cytoplasm. So the steroid hormones, remember the cortisol, aldosterone, all those steroid hormones Corticosterone, those steroid hormones, their receptors are found within the cytoplasm. So once the hormone goes, so for it to be transported in the first place, you know to say that uh, it's, uh, it's uh, fat soluble, so it can't dissolve in plasma. It needs to bind to plasma proteins, then to be transported to the target cells. Once it gets to the target cell, it will be able to cross the phospholipid bilayer, and then it will go and bind to receptors that are found in the cytoplasm. So the receptor hormone complex, some of them they can migrate to the nucleus where they are going to facilitate transcription of the DNA into messenger RNA. So most of these steroid hormones, they will have an effect on protein synthesis. Why? It's because they are involved in activation of transcription of the DNA into messenger RNA. So some of the receptors 
are found within the cytoplasm, especially the receptors for steroid hormones. Then we also have receptors that are found within the nucleus, and those are the receptors for thyroid hormones. So in the cell nucleus, the receptors for thyroid hormones are found in the nucleus and are believed to be located in direct association with one or more of the chromosomes. So this is where the receptors for thyroid hormones are found. So the thyroid hormones, they are also involved in protein synthesis. They are going to increase metabolism of the body. Why? Because once you produce a lot of thyroid hormones, which are also referred to as metabolic hormones, the T3, T4, triiodothyronine, and the tetraiodothyronine, once they are released by the thyroid gland, they are going to be transported by binding to plasma proteins like globulins, so they will be able to be transported to the target cells of the body. And when they get to the target cells, they will be able to cross a phospholipid barrier to enter the cytoplasm. Then they will be transported by intracellular proteins again to the nucleus. In the nucleus, they will go and bind to nuclear receptors. And once they bind to the receptors, they can trigger transcription. You have messenger RNA production of proteins, and some of these proteins will be enzymes that are involved in metabolism. So you find that the metabolism of the body, they are going to increase once you have an increase in thyroid hormone secretions that are transported to the target cells, which makes sense. So by now you understand there are three major sites where receptors could be located to interact with the hormones. So we have receptors on the surface of the cell membrane, the receptors that are found in the cytoplasm, and receptors that are found inside the nucleus. And I've already given you some examples of these receptors. Mechanism of hormone action. So what is the major mechanism, mechanism of hormone function? So action. So mechanism of hormone action, how do these now hormones, when they interact with the receptors, how do they bring about changes in these cells so that the cell will respond to that interaction between a receptor and a hormone? So these are just general mechanisms. But as we go on, we will now narrow down to a specific mechanism for each and every hormone that we'll be discussing in this series of, of lectures that we have. So the endocrine system acts by releasing hormones that in turn trigger actions in specific target cells. Receptors on target cell membranes bind only to one type of hormone. So more than 50 human hormones have been identified. They all act by binding to receptor molecules. So there are more than 50 human hormones that have been identified and these hormones, they all act via a receptor. So there's interaction between a receptor and a hormone, but each receptor is specific for a particular hormone. So you find that there's a specific receptor for insulin hormone, there's a specific receptor for glucagon hormone, there's a specific receptor for thy uh, thyroid hormone, parathyroid hormone, all those hormones, they will interact with specific receptors. That's why the response won't be the same. If the cell is responding to insulin, it's not the same response that you are going to get if the cell is responding to thyroid hormones. So there will be different response de dependent on which receptors are being activated. The binding hormone changes, so the binding, the binding hormone changes the shape of the receptor causing the response to the hormone. So when the hormone binds to the receptor, it's going to bring about change of the receptor. When there is change in the structure or shape of the receptor, that can now bring about a response to that particular hormone. So there are two mechanisms of hormone action on all target cells. So the mechanism by which these hormones are going to act on these cells is also dependent on the solubility, the solubility, whether they are water soluble or fat soluble. So we have steroid hormones and non-steroid hormones. Because of the nature of these hormones, their mechanisms are different. Whether they are entering the cell or they are outside the cell interacting with the receptor on the surface of the cell membrane. So the solubility will have an effect on the mechanism of the hormones. So we have what we call non-steroidal hormones, non-steroidal hormones, or hormones with a cell surface receptor. So non-steroid hormones, the non-steroid hormones, 
they have their receptors on the surface of the cell membrane. That's where you're going to find the receptors because they are water soluble. So I've already explained to say the water soluble hormones, they, they don't have the capacity to cross a phospholipid bilayer. So you find that their receptors are just located on the surface of the cell membrane because of the solubility. Then we have the steroid hormones. The steroid hormones or hormones with intracellular receptors. So the steroid hormones, because in terms of structure, they are more like uh, cholesterol. So they're a derivative of cholesterol. So cholesterol is fat soluble. So it can dissolve. It can also dissolve in plasma and also cross a phospholipid by layer to enter the cells. So their receptors will be within the cells. So they have intracellular receptors. So depending on the solubility, whether they are water soluble or lipid soluble. Comparing the two different types of hormones, the water soluble hormones and lipid soluble hormones, and given are the ex examples in this table, so we have the parameters that you are going to use to differentiate the lipid soluble and water soluble. The lipid soluble hormones examples, we have steroid hormones, thyroid hormones, water soluble hormones, peptides, proteins, and those catecholamines and some of the amines, they are water soluble. So the receptors, by looking at the solubility, you'll be able to tell. The lipid soluble, I've said that the receptors are inside the cell. So some of the receptors are in the nucleus, like for the thyroid hormones. Most of the steroid hormones, the receptors are in the cytoplasm. So receptor hormone complex can migrate to the nucleus and then to have an effect on the transcription of the DNA or the hormones that are involved in the transcription of DNA because they will have an effect on the enzymes that are involved in transcription as well. The water-soluble hormones, the receptors are outer surface of the cell membrane because they can't penetrate the cells to go inside of the cell. So the water-soluble hormones like peptides and proteins, their receptors are on the outer surface of the cell membrane. The intracellular action. So what is the intracellular action that will be triggered by the receptor hormone interaction? For the lipid soluble hormones that are entering the cells, they are going to stimulate the synthesis of new proteins. So you know to say they are involved in transcription. After transcription, messenger RNA will move to the ribosomes on the raffinopasmic reticulum for synthesis of proteins or for production of protein. So there is translation of the messenger RNA into a polypeptide chain that is taking place at the raffinopasmic reticulum because that's where you find the ribosomes, which are the machinery that are involved in protein synthesis. Then the water-soluble hormones, because they are not entering the cell, the intracellular action that will be there, production of second messengers. So this is where the G protein coupled receptors come in. So there will be production of second messengers. So the first messengers are outside the cell. Then these uh, first messengers, they are coming in in form of hormones. They will go and bind to the receptors, they bring about change in the structure of the receptor, activating other enzymes inside the cell that will bring about production of second messengers. So you find that there will be production of second messengers within the cell. Second messengers like cyclic AMP, so the CAMP or cyclic AMP, the insulin, instead, so you have insulin, instead, instead activates the intra, the, the, so you have the cyclic AMP, then you also have insulin, instead activates the membrane bound tyrosine kinase. So you have insulin that can also activate the other enzymes like tyrosine kinase. So if insulin goes and bind, there will be activation of insulin substrates that will also activate enzymes like tyrosine kinase and the tyrosine kinase will bring about other second messengers. Then you have second messengers that will modify action of intracellular proteins like enzymes, like protein kinase A that is modified by cyclic AMP and also other second messengers that as a result of the hormones that are interacting with the receptors so this is the action that you'll see inside of the cell storage lipid soluble hormones we say that they are only synthesized as needed except for thyroid hormones so thyroid hormones in as much as they are 
they are fat in nature, they are fat soluble, they will still be synthesized and packaged within vesicles. But most of the fat soluble hormones or lipid soluble hormones, they are actually synthesized when they are needed. So you find that their production is enhanced when there is need for that particular steroid hormone. Then the water soluble hormones, they are produced because they are proteins in nature. So they are produced and then stored in vesicles. So they are stored in vesicles as pro hormone and stored in these vesicles along with the enzyme that will split off the active hormone. So most of them, they are stored as pro hormone. So along with the enzymes that will activate or that will change them from pro hormone into the active hormone. So that once there is exocytosis of these hormones, the enzymes that are stored with these pro-hormones, they will activate the hormones. And then what will be transported will be an active hormone that will have an effect on target cells. Plasma transport, how are they transported? So the lipid-soluble hormones, because they don't dissolve in plasma, so they are going to attach to plasma proteins. So they are attached to plasma proteins that will serve as carriers except adrenal androgens so the adrenal androgens they are not binding to plasma proteins they are they are also kind of dissolving within plasma so the androgens most of them they don't bind to plasma proteins but most of the lipid soluble hormones they will have to bind to plasma proteins then we the water soluble hormones because they are water soluble hormones it means they're just going to dissolve in plasma as free and bound hormones so they are just dissolving in plasma then they are transported there is no need for them to bind to plasma proteins the half-life so the half-life for the lipid soluble hormones it's long then for the water soluble hormones is short here again it's very easy to understand because the lipid soluble hormones once they are released, they are going to bind into plasma proteins and then slowly they will be released to the circulation where they will be used up by the tissue. But the water soluble hormones, because they are not binding to plasma proteins, so once they are released, they will move to the tissues and then they will be used up. So you find that lipid soluble hormones, they have a longer half-life as compared to water soluble hormones, which makes sense. The intracellular signaling pathways. So the intracellular signaling after hormone receptor activation. So now after this hormone has bind, it has bound to a receptor, activating the receptor. What is the intracellular signaling pathway? So like I said, that there is a, a cascade of reaction that takes place dependent on the type of hormones. So here we'll just mention some of the mechanisms, the common mechanisms. Okay, so the first one, the ion channel linked receptors. So these are the receptors that are being activated. Ion channel linked receptor. They are also referred to as ligand gated ion channels. So the ion channel linked receptor or ligand gated ion channels. So a ligand in this case, it's a hormone that is going to bind to a receptor. And this receptor is coupled with ion channel. So it's a gated, it's, it's a gate for ion channel. So once a ligand binds to the receptor, the channel opens up to allow movement of ions. It could be positively charged cations or negatively charged anions. So they are referred to as ion channel linked receptor okay so this is the mechanism that is taking place so you can see in this diagram you have a receptor that is linked with a channel an ion channel so at the center here you have an ion channel that is linked with a receptor so the signaling path uh, molecule is a ligand or a hormone that can come and bind to the receptor but if there is no interaction between the hormone and the receptor, the gate is closed. So you can see the gate is closed for ion channels. This ion can't move here. Why? It's because the gate is closed. So it's a ligand gated ion channel. When a ligand, which is a hormone, comes and binds, it causes change 
in the receptor that will cause now the gate to open so you can see that change in the protein receptor causing the gate to open when the gate is open ion channel the ions can move from outside into the cell or from inside to the outside of the cell depending on the electrochemical gradient of these ions so if they are more outside they will enter and these ions that are entering they will bring about cellular response so if it's calcium that is entering and you know to say calcium will go and bind to camodulin if it's smooth muscles or it can go and bind to troponin c if uh, skeletal muscles or cardiac muscle so once there is that interaction it will bring about smooth muscle skeletal muscle cardiac muscle contraction so the cellular response that you are going to get there is cell contraction so that's just an example but the moment the hormone moves away from the from the receptor then the receptor will change shape again the gate will close so that there is no movement of ions so this is a mechanism by which a ligand can go and bind to the receptor causing the opening of ligand gated ion channels then this can produce a cellular response that's one mechanism then the other mechanism is via the enzyme linked hormone receptors enzyme linked hormone receptors they are also referred to as enzyme coupled receptors enzyme coupled receptors how do they operate so this is a receptor that is coupled with an enzyme so once a hormone goes and bind it can activate the enzyme that will convert substrate into products and then you have a cellular response so they are called enzyme linked hormone receptors or enzyme coupled receptors so an example there the signaling with enzyme coupled receptors so you can see in this diagram down there the first part you don't have a hormone or signaling molecule binding to the receptors then the enzymatic domain is inactive form so you can see inactive catalytic domain meaning that this enzyme is not active but the moment the hormone or the signal molecule comes and binds to the receptors there is activation of the enzyme part of this receptor so we have the active catalytic domain of the receptor so you have enzyme linked enzyme linked receptor so you have enzyme linked uh, receptors so once a hormone comes in bind and then there is activation of the enzyme part of the receptor then it will catalyze the reaction but once there is hydrolysis or breakdown of the hormone then it goes back into the resting state but once there is a, a hormone a signal molecule that will come and bind here the enzyme is activated so you have activated associated enzyme that is linked with a receptor okay so that is that was an example of enzyme linked hormone receptors then the other ones are more complicated but they are quite interesting because most of the students will still understand how they operate the g protein linked hormone receptors g protein linked hormone receptors they are also referred to as g protein coupled receptors the g protein coupled receptors so when we are discussing muscle physiology especially smooth muscle cell contraction we discussed the g protein coupled receptors so we said these these are the receptors that will be activated by neurotransmitters that are stimulating smooth muscle contraction so the calcium that was being mobilized from the sarcoplasmic sarcoplasmic reticulum is very complicated because it involves the activation of g protein coupled receptors that's what we said so you need that ip3 the inositol triphosphate to go and bind to ip3 receptors to mobilize calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum and smooth muscle cells which is more complicated but it will involve the g protein coupled receptors so how do they work similar here so the g protein coupled receptors they are complex very complicated but interesting because it's very easy for you to understand so you have the receptor and the g protein so it's called g protein coupled receptor when a hormone or a ligand that is shown in blue here is not binding to the receptor there is no interaction between the g protein and the receptor 
The G protein, some of them, they are composed of three protein subunits, the alpha, beta, gamma protein subunits. On the alpha protein subunits, you have GDP, guanosine diphosphate. It means that the G protein is in a resting state or basal state, the resting state. But the moment a hormone comes and binds, there is interaction between the G protein and the receptor. So there is change in the shape of the receptor that will bring about interaction between the receptor and the G protein the G protein and the receptor, there's interaction. So once there's this interaction, there's displacement of GDP by the GTP on the alpha protein subunit. So on the alpha protein subunit, because of this interaction, the GDP will be displaced by GTP. Once you have GTP on the alpha protein subunit, there is activation of the G protein. So you can see the displacement of GDP by the GTP. When that happens, then the G protein has been activated. In the active form, there is dissociation between the alpha and the beta gamma protein subunits. There is dissociation of the alpha from the beta gamma protein subunits. The alpha protein subunit can go and activate an enzyme, for instance, adenosyclase enzyme that will convert ATP into cyclic AMP. And then the beta gamma protein subunit can go and activate phospholipase C that will break down phosphatidylinositol bisphosphate into DAG and IP3. So the IP3 is the one now that will mobilize calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So you can see that happening. The alpha protein subunit will go and activate an enzyme, an enzyme 1, which could be an adenocyclase enzyme, then the beta gamma protein subunit will go and bind and activate enzyme 2. An example is phospholipase C. Okay, so you can see the enzymes. The adenocyclase enzyme that is being activated by alpha protein subunit. Then the beta gamma is going to activate phospholipase C enzyme. So the phospholipase C, once it has been activated, is going to break down phosphatidylinositobisphosphate into diacylglycyl molecule and IP3. Of course, you have kinases that are adding phosphates to phosphatidylinositol. So you have the addition of other phosphates until you get phosphatidylinositobisphosphate that will be broken down by phospholipase C into diacylglycyl molecule and IP3. IP3 will go and bind to the IP3 receptors that will bring about mobilization of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And that calcium will go and bind to camodulin. Calcium camodulin interaction will activate the mouse in kinase. It's a kinase. What does it do? It causes a phosphorylation reaction of the mouse in heads by breaking down ATP and adding the phosphates into the mouse in heads. Then once the mouse in heads are phosphorylated in spoof muscle cell, we say they're going to interact with actin. So there's actin mouse interaction that will bring about spoof muscle contraction. So that will be the cellular response. So these are G protein coupled receptors. Okay. Then once they do their functions, these enzymes, the G protein needs to go back into the resting state. How does it go back? So on the alpha protein subunits where you have GTP, once the GTP is hydrolyzed or it's broken down into GDP and inorganic phosphate, then this alpha protein subunit will increase its affinity towards the beta gamma protein subunit. So it will detach itself from enzyme one, then it will go and bind with the beta gamma protein subunits. And then it goes back into the basal state or the resting state or the G protein waiting for another signal if another hormone goes and bind to the receptor. Okay, so this is just a summary of what I was explaining. So we do have phosphatidylinositol bisphosphate, which are examples of, you know, you have phosphatidylinositol as examples of phospholipids that are associated with the cell membrane. Then with the phosphorylation reaction, they can be converted into phosphatidylinositol bisphosphate. Then this can be converted by the enzyme phospholipase C. The enzyme phospholipase C needs to be activated by the G protein. 
So I've told you to say once the hormone goes and binds to the to the receptor, there's interaction between the G protein and the receptor. Then the alpha protein subunit, we have GDP that will be displaced by GTP. Once there's that, that displacement, the alpha protein subunit will be activated. So the alpha the, the alpha protein subunit will touch itself from the beta gamma. It will go and activate enzyme A, which is the adenylcyclase enzyme. Then the beta gamma is going to activate phospholipase C. So this phospholipase C is the one now that is breaking down phosphatidyl inositol bisphosphate into DAG, which is diacyl glycerol molecule, and IP3. IP3 is water soluble. It will dissolve in the cytosol or the cytoplasm. Then it will go and bind to the IP3 receptors or the sarcoplasmic reticulum to mobilize calcium. That will move now into the sarcoplasm. Then it can go and bind to camodulin. Calcium camodulin complex will activate enzymes, the kinase, <clears throat> the mouse enhanced kinase, that will phosphorate the mouse enhanced to bring about muscle contraction. And some of the calcium can activate enzymes. Those enzymes are involved maybe in exocytosis of uh, other hormones or other products that are being produced by these cells. Then you can see the DAG here because the DAG is a diacylglycerol molecule. So it has got two fatty acid chains. So it's fat soluble. It can dissolve in the cytosol. It will be moving within the plasma membrane, activating other enzymes. So you can see it can go and activate enzymes like protein kinase C and this protein kinase C, they're involved to activate uh, antipod proteins like hydrogen, sodium, antipod protein. So you are pumping hydrogen out of the cell, you're pumping sodium into the cell. So if you are pumping hydrogen out of the cell, it means the pH is increasing of this particular cell. So that will be the cellular response, the pH will start increasing. So these are some of the mechanism by which the hormones are going to activate the receptors and then you have a cascade of reactions that are taking place okay <clears throat> so it's the same information here we have a hormone which is a peptide the receptors are found in the plasma membrane of the cells so you have the phospholipid bilayer and proteins which are receptors a protein hormone can come and bind or a peptide hormone can come and bind activating the g protein activating enzymes like phospholipase c that will break down phosphatidylinositobisphosphate into DAG and IP3. Then the IP3 can bring about smooth muscle contraction. Then you have DAG that can activate other enzymes like inactive protein kinase C can be activated into the active protein kinase C. Then the protein kinase C can also catalyze certain reactions. So you can see phosphorylation reaction that is taking place there. Then you have a cellular response. Just like when you have culture, we can also have a cellular response. That could be a contraction or exocytosis of whatever the cell is producing. So some of the hormones are to use the phospholipase C second messenger system. So these are some of the hormones that when they go and bind to the receptors, they will activate the phospholipase C that will increase the calcium levels into the cells. So the angiotensin 2, angiotensin 2 can cause vascular smooth muscle contraction or vascular smooth muscle contraction. So you have vasoconstriction when you have angiotensin 2. Why is it because the angiotensin 2 will activate the G protein that will also activate the phospholipase C. Once the phospholipase C has been activated, it's going to convert or to activate the conversion of phosphatidyl inositol bisphosphate into IP3 and diacylglycerol molecules. So the IP3 will go and mobilize calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum or the sarcoplasmic reticulum that will mobilize a lot of calcium and the calcium will go and bind to camodulin. Calcium camodulin complex, of course, it, it will go and activate the mouse in light chain kinase that will now cause phosphorylation of the mouse in heads, then contraction of smooth muscle, hence vasoconstriction. So the smooth muscle cells that are found lining the vascular walls, they will contract to bring about vasoconstriction when we have angiotensin 2. The catecholamines can also cause vasoconstriction. So catecholamines like epinephrine or epinephrine, we know that it can cause 
vasoconstriction via the alpha receptors. So they're going to bind to the alpha receptors to cause vasoconstriction. The gonadotropin releasing hormone is going to increase the release of growth hormone, for instance. Why? It's because it's going to increase the activation of phospholipase C and mobilizing calcium. Calcium is required for exocytosis. So you find that under the influence of gonadotropin releasing hormone, then the release of growth hormone is going to increase. Why? It's because is going to increase calcium levels that will bring about exocytosis. Then the growth hormone releasing hormone. The growth hormone releasing hormone. So for gonadotropin releasing hormone, of course, it's, it's encouraging or stimulating the release of gonadotropins. The gonadotropins, we have two there. The follicular stimulating hormone and the routinizing hormone. So the follicular stimulating hormone and the routinizing hormone, those are the gonadotropes. So the gonadotropin releasing hormone is going to enhance the release of gonadotropes, which are follicular stimulating hormone and routinizing hormone. But of course, it's working, it's working by activating the phospholipase C. <clears throat> then we have the growth hormone releasing hormone. So these hormones are the releasing hormones that are being produced by the hypothalamus. So deep in the brain tissue, we have the hypothalamus that is just under the thalamus. So they are the ones that are producing these hormones, the releasing hormones but they'll have an effect on the anterior pituitary gland to release other hormones. So how do they do that? It's by activating the phospholipase C to increase calcium levels in these glandular cells so that there will be exocytosis because the calcium can go and bind to V-snare, T-snare, synaptobrevin syntaxing interaction, of course, and sign up, uh, sign up molecules, all those they are going to increase exocytosis of other hormones. Then oxytocin can also bring about smooth muscle contraction. So when oxytocin goes and binds to smooth muscle cells or the uterus, of course, it's going to bring about contraction. Why? It's because phospholipase C will increase the production of IP3 that will mobilize more calcium and you need calcium for these smooth muscle cells to contract. So oxytocin can bring about smooth muscle contraction. So even the myoepithelium or the breasts, they are going to contract to squeeze milk out of the nipples. So there will be expression of milk out of the nipples because of oxytocin that is causing the contraction of myoepithelium in the breasts. That's the, the whole point there. Then we have the thyroid releasing hormone. The thyroid releasing hormone is also going to activate the phospholipase C. And then they will increase the calcium concentration that will bring about exocytosis or thyroid stimulating hormone by the anterior pituitary gland. So the anterior pituitary gland, there are cells there that are producing thyroid stimulating hormone. They are going to be they are going to be stimulated to release thyroid re, uh, stimulating hormone by the thyroid releasing hormone that is coming from the hypothalamus. Vasopressin is the other name for ADH, antidiuretic hormone. So if it's functioning on the smooth muscle cells or the blood vessels, it's called vasopressin or arginine vasopressin. It's going to act via the V1 receptors. But in renal physiology, if you remember, I told you that the same ADH is going to bind to V2 receptors. So it will have different response depending on the receptors. So to the smooth muscle cells in the cardiovascular system, it's going to bind to V1 receptors, increasing the activation of phospholipase C, mobilization of calcium because of uh, inositol triphosphate that will bind to IP3 receptors of the endoplasmic reticulum or sarcoplasmic reticulum. Then it will bring about smooth muscle contraction, vasoconstriction. So it's also called vasopressin when you're looking at the function of ADH on the cardiovascular system, it's called vasopressin. But when you go to the kidneys, it's via the V2 receptors. And you know to say, in the kidneys, the V2 receptors will bring about translocation of aquaporins too, to be embedded within the apical side of the epithelium cells. So the aquaporins too, they are involved in osmosis. So a reabsorption of water is going to increase when ADH goes and bind to V2 receptors, because even there it will bring about translocation of aquaporins by activation of protein kinase that are also involved in translocation of aquaporins proteins. Water-soluble hormones, 
the water soluble hormones so you know to say these are the ones that are binding to the receptors that are found on the cell membrane of the cells so the plasma membrane of the cells they do have receptors for water soluble hormones so these are called water soluble hormone receptors so you can see you have a receptor coupled with a G protein so the process I've already explained here so the hormone can come and bind to the receptor activating the G protein then the G protein there will be dissociation or the beta gamma from the alpha protein subunit the alpha protein subunit will go and activate an enzyme then the beta gamma protein subunit can also go and activate another enzyme to bring about a cascade of reactions of which I've mentioned I don't know how many times now so we make progress so they are produced by the endocrine gland cells then they are released into the interstitium they will dissolve into the interstitial fluid then they will enter the capillaries transported by the blood vessels to the target cells that do have a specific receptor for that hormone so this hormone is a, if it's a water soluble it will just cross the capillaries to go into the interstitium and then to go and bind the receptor activating receptors so there could be g protein coupled receptors or iron gated receptors or other receptors that are found on the plasma membrane of the cell then the target cell is going to respond to the hormone okay so it's the same here so what is happening here is that one the hormone is going to bind the receptor activating the g protein so the g protein was in active state once there is interaction you will see that there will be activation then they will go and activate other enzymes so you can see here in two the receptor and hormone complex has been formed activating the g protein and then the inactive ad adenylcyclase enzyme will be activated so we have adenylate cyclase or adenylcyclase enzyme that will be activated okay so you can see the activation of this enzyme that will convert ATP into cyclic AMP. The cyclic AMP will cause other reactions because there are enzymes that are sensitive or dependent on cyclic AMP that will be activated. So you can see those enzymes that are dependent on cyclic AMP, they will be activated. Then to bring about cellular response. Then, of course, we have lipid soluble hormone receptors, of which we say it's the location of these receptors could be in the cytoplasm or in the nucleus so this is the target cell you have the nucleus where you find the dna and the dna doesn't leave the nucleus then you have the rough endoplasmic reticulum where you're going to find ribosomes and some of these ribosomes are free ribosomes in the cytoplasm so the receptors are found in the cytoplasm and also in the nucleus. In the cytoplasm, you have receptors for steroid hormones. In the nucleus, you have receptors for thyroid hormones. Thyroid hormones. So steroid hormones, thyroid hormones. So these are lipid soluble hormones. So they are called lipophilic hormones. So they don't have receptors on the plasma membrane. They are able to cross because they are fat soluble or they are lipid soluble. So during transportation, they need to bind to plasma proteins, then they'll be transported to the target cells, they'll be released to the target cells, they'll be able to cross the phospholipid bilayer of the cells to enter the cells, then they'll go and bind to the receptors in the cytoplasm, some of them they'll go and bind to the receptors in the nucleus, so you have nuclear receptor and cytoplasmic receptor. Those they, that have receptors within the cytoplasm, once the hormone goes and binds to the receptor, the hormone receptor complex will migrate to the nucleus then here they are going to enhance transcription so you can see transcription that is being enhanced or activated by this receptor hormone complex they are activating enzymes that are involved in transcription then the dna will be transcribed into a messenger rna the messenger rna carrying the message from the dna it will now leave the nucleus it will go to the ribosomes the ribosomes you have the schist s the 40s at the center of the transfer rna that will translate the message so as it's reading the codon you to know which amino acids to attach then you can see the polypeptide chain that is growing out of the ribosome because of translation so this is called protein synthesis or protein translation there will be production of proteins that's why i told you the steroid hormones thyroid hormones they will increase the number of protein that is being produced within the cell. Some of these proteins are enzymes that are involved in metabolism. Some of these proteins, they could be structural proteins in a muscle cell 
or contracture of proteins in a muscle cell. So the muscle cell will start increasing. It will cause hypertrophy. Okay. So some of the action of these hormones is immediate. And some of the action can take a day, two days, or sometimes even a month, you will still get a response because it's activating certain genes within the cells. So this is how the lipid soluble hormones, they are going to interact with the receptors so that you get a response. This is a diagram that is just combining the two types of hormones, those that, are, that have receptors inside the cells or on the plasma membrane of the cell. So peptide hormones and biogenic amines, which are catecholamines, and thyroid hormones, they, are, they don't have receptors here, but here you're talking of catecholamines mainly. So you find that their receptors are on the plasma membrane. So they will operate via G-protein coupled receptors or ligand gated ion channels. Then we have the steroid hormones that are fat soluble or lipophilic, so they are able to cross a phospholipid bilayer to enter, to bind to receptors in the cytoplasm and also to receptors in the nucleus. So you have nuclear receptor that will bring about transcription, messenger RNA, then protein synthesis, and some of these proteins are enzymes that are being produced. So you can see for the peptides, hormones, mainly G protein coupled receptors that will produce second messengers. And these second messengers, it could be cyclic AMP or calcium IP3 or DAG that will bring about cellular response. So if they are proteins, they can cause phosphorylation or dephosphorylation of proteins, then they will regulate the enzymes. We have cellular response. So this is just a general way in which the hormones are going to activate specific receptors for you to get a response. But as we go on, like I said, will be explaining the mechanism for each hormone that we'll be discussing. If there is a pathology, what happens? If there is resistance to a particular hormone like insulin resistance in diabetes type 2, if there is diabetes type 1, what happens? You need to appreciate all that. What receptors are, is insulin going to bind? And what happens when insulin binds to the receptor? What are the specific intracellular uh, cascade of reactions that are activated? So you need to appreciate all that. So don't worry, this is just the, the introduction to endocrine. So from today onwards, we will now go into the specifics. So there will be specific hormones. So we'll start with the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland that are controlling other hormones. Then we'll go into the specific hormones for endocrine. Then later on, we'll discuss the, the reproductive physiology. Okay, so this is the last slide now. We are looking at the clearance of hormones from the blood. So we've now have a general picture on how the hormones are going to activate the receptors and the responses that you can get when that happens. So once the hormones have done their function, how are they going to be removed from the body? Because as long as they remain there, they are going to continuously stimulate the cells and you're going to be getting the continuous response. So to control for that, how are they removed from the body? So this is the clearance of hormones from the blood or from the body. So there are two factors that can increase or decrease the concentration of hormones in the blood. The first factor is the rate of hormone secretion into the blood. How much hormones are secreted by the glandular cells? So if the secretion is increasing, even the concentration of hormones is going to increase. So whatever is stimulating the production of these hormones, it can also stimulate the release of these hormones by the glandular cells. It will have an effect on the concentration of hormones in circulation. Then also the metabolic clearance of the hormone. So we have the metabolic clearance rate of the hormone, how much is being removed from circulation by a lot of reactions that are taking place. So the rate of removal of the hormone from the blood. So that is referred to as the metabolic clearance rate, which is equal to the rate of disappearance of hormone from the plasma divided by the concentration of hormone in each milliliter of plasma. So this is the rate at which the hormone is being removed from circulation. So there are factors that can remove the hormone from circulation or reactions that can remove the hormone 
from circulation that will bring about the metabolic clearance of the hormone so the clearance of hormones from the uh, from the blood hormones are cleared from the plasma in several ways and these will include so these are some of the ways in which the hormones will be removed from the blood or from the body so some of them we have metabolic destruction by the tissue so the tissues they do contain certain enzymes that can break down the hormones so there is metabolic destruction of these hormones by the tissue themselves the target tissues once the hormones go and bind to the receptors activation of the receptor you have a cellular response so some of these tissues will produce enzymes that will break down the hormone so that uh, its effect on the receptor is removed so those are called metabolic destruction by the tissue then we have binding with the tissue so some of the hormones that are binding with the tissue you'll find that they can be internalized so you have endocytosis of those hormone receptor complex then they will fuse with the rhizosomes and then they'll be destroyed by rhizosomes so you find that they are binding with the tissue and then they'll be destroyed together with the receptors sometimes then the products the byproducts that are coming from there will be recycled for the production of new receptors and so on by the cell itself then they can also be excreted by the liver into the bowel so excretion by the liver into the bowel so they are being excreted by the liver so the liver contains some enzymes that can break down certain hormones and then after the breakdown of the hormones the byproducts are incorporated within the bowel and you know to say bowel is going to be emptied into the duodenum the sphincter of od is regulated by the cholecystokinin so with the influence of cholecystokinin the secretin you know to say the sphincter of od is going to open up to allow movement of bowel so that bowel now will move into the lumen of the git then it will be incorporated into the fecal material then it can be excreted from the body then you have excretion by the kidney into the urine so some of the hormones they will be broken down they will be filtered by the kidney then they'll be uh, removed together with the urine so they'll be just part of the waste product within the urine after the destruction of these hormones so these are the four ways in which hormones can be cleared out of the body so the clearance of hormones from the body okay so with this information we are done with today's lecture then we'll start lecture three where now we'll discuss the hypothalamus the pituitary gland, the anterior and the posterior pituitary gland, then we'll go to discuss the hormones that are being produced by the anterior pituitary gland that will have an effect on other glandular cells to regulate the production of other hormones. Then from there, maybe we'll go to the thyroid hormones, the adrenal, so on and so forth. Otherwise, enjoy the lectures.